So, does this image look more like a duck or a rabbit? To me, it seems more like a duck. You can clearly see a beak. Now, how about this image? Does it look like two faces or a chalice? To me, it seems like two faces. You can sort of work out the nose and the mouth. Now, how about this image? I'm sure we've all seen it before, this dress. Is this dress blue and black or white and gold? To me, it looks as though it's blue and black. But according to 145,000 retweets on this Twitter post, this dress is white and gold. So let's look at these tweets. Bob3000 says, if you don't think this dress is white and gold, then you are blind. And Miles Hates Alien says, you are dumb. It's blue and black. So I'm sure we've all seen this dress before. And I'm sure we've all debated what color this dress is. But that's not what I want to be addressing about today. Rather, what I hope to address is how this one image is causing so much disagreement and animosity. How come people can see the exact same image but come to completely different conclusions? So on this idea, I began to wonder, why do we turn to certain absolute disciplines like science rather than the more muddy ones like philosophy? Why do we hate the unknown and embrace the comforting truths? I love philosophy. The myriad of arguments, the back and forth. What's the most ethical thing to do? Does God exist? Is the mind separate from the brain, or is the brain the mind? But I'm sure many of you in the audience think that this is a worthless subject. And to be honest, my parents would probably agree. <laughs> However, you guys may also think that philosophy is something that's not useful. People will end up jobless, homeless, probably muttering on the streets completely useless arguments to unanswerable questions that don't even need to be answered in the first place. And I understand why you may think this. Having parents who are business-minded that see the world in economics and numbers, I grew up having no interest in the things that did not give the hard truths, the hard answers. I thought truth and the world were founded on the empirical objective facts of science. So let's test this objectivity. We've all been in science class hearing our teachers ramble on about atoms, protons, or electrons. But have you ever seen an atom, an electron, or a proton? The answer is no. So then how do we know that they exist? Well, we know that they exist because we set up experiments based on assumptions that we make that are inherently by nature subjective. And then we expect certain results. And if those results are what we achieve, then we can safely assume our original hypothesis to be true. That's the scientific method. It's based on assumptions which are inherently subjective. Our supposedly objective facts are actually subjective. And we've seen this time and time again throughout history. Isaac Newton, one of the greatest minds in the history of humanity, thought gravity was a force. And the proof is simple. That's why the apple falls off the tree, hits Newton on the head, and falls on the ground. It seems almost intuitive, almost incomprehensible for that not to be the case. But then Einstein came along and saw gravity in a completely different way. He rather saw it as distortions in space and time, like this image behind me. And after much scientific advancement, we were able to prove Einstein right and disprove Newton. The objective fact of gravity was originally wrong. Science is not as objective as we'd like to think. And so I hope this illustrates the fact that science is subjective. As my physics teacher says, physics is all about reconstructing the surroundings and breaking them down into easy, sizable chunks and understanding the flaws within your intuitions. Or I guess in other words, science can just be the act of embracing and playing around with ambiguity deducing these scientific models from our world and seeing what we can make the most utility out of and deriving what is most useful. So I hope you can do the same reconstruction of your brains, just as a scientist or just as a philosopher, and see the world for its subjectivity. So then if this is the case, then why is it so apparent that science is useful and philosophy is not? Why is it so obvious that science has real world effects and not philosophy? Well, the common answer is, philosophy never comes to one true answer. But I'd argue that's exactly where the power lies. Rather, what is problematic is trying to find objective truths where they don't exist. So let's illustrate this in a thought experiment, a classic that us philosophers love. So I really want the new PS5, and my friend has the new PS5. Should I steal the PS5? Well, the obvious answer is no, for two reasons. Firstly, I'd be betraying his trust. But secondly, if I logically think about it, if I steal the PS5, then I think it's okay for anyone to steal. And if that's the case, then the whole world would descend into anarchy. And so then, I must think that rules and certain actions have inherent morality. 
and in philosophical terms, that made me a deontologist. I think the rules are the most important. But as I've shown, the world is not so clear cut. It's ambiguous, it's muddy. And so let's look at another classical moral dilemma. If I need to steal from a wealthy person in order to feed my dying child, what should I do? You see, now it becomes more unclear. It's more subjective. Stealing might not be as bad as I once thought. Rather, I might think that the outcomes are what matter. So then, in philosophical terms, I'd be a utilitarian. What matters most is the outcomes. So now, I have two very good ethical theories. What should I do? Should I be a deontologist or should I be a utilitarian? Which ethical system will give me the right answer? And I think this illustrates perfectly why many people think philosophy is useless. They think that there are two answers to one question, and that seems incomprehensible because we are uncomfortable with the fact of embracing ambiguity. The truth is both of these ethical theories are correct. The world is such an ambiguous place, which is why we have so many different scientific models, just as we have multiple ethical models. And that isn't a bad thing. It simply means that we have a huge repertoire of ethical systems to look into. For example, just as a physicist picks the best scientific model given the current situation, or just as a mathematician picks the best equation to solve a certain problem, philosophers have this huge repertoire of ethical systems to dive into. So I hope this shows that there'll never be truly an objective answer that objective truths don't exist, and that shouldn't be scary. In fact, that should be the most beautiful thing. There are no objective truths in our subjective world. And so if we think about this, if that's the case, then why do we train our children and future generations on certain facts, test scores, and objective truths when the world is filled with multitudes of truth? That's exactly why philosophy is useful. It teaches us to embrace with that ambiguity. It equips us with the tools to navigate and deal with the complexities of the world. But more importantly, on a greater, grander scheme of things, if we don't choose to promote ambiguity and we continue to reject subjectivity, then we get division. Because division is the inability to embrace ambiguity. Division is the inability to understand the different perspectives within our world. Division, thereby hatred and anger and animosity, as we've seen at the start of this talk from the dress and the retweets. Those angry tweets are manifestations of the inability to embrace ambiguity. Just because I think this dress is blue and black and not white and gold does not mean I should insult you, discriminate you, or hate you. Einstein thought differently to Newton, and from that we got a more comprehensive worldview of gravity. And who's to say that Einstein is not wrong either? You see, ambiguity does not mean that there are no right answers, but it also does not mean that all the answers are correct either. It simply means that there are differing views and perspectives that can coexist in our subjective world. So I urge us to embrace ambiguity so that we can escape this hatred, escape this anger, and escape this division. And hopefully, by doing so, by embracing ambiguity and opening our arms to subjectivity, we can see the world for the multi-dimensional power it holds. Thank you.